I'm Deborah Bogar, facilitator for this one-hour NACD Urban and Community Conservation Webinar on the North Cove Coastal Project. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on NACD's website along with a presentation PDF uh, and video for your future access. You should be connected online to see the presentation in our 26-minute video. You can access audio via your computer or book by phone, and those directions were sent with your confirmation email. As the opening slide indicates, all lines are muted except for the speakers. I'll open the chat area after the presentation so you can type in your questions and comments, and we'll take as many as we can. You might want to jot them down during the presentation. In this webinar system, the transitions will take a few seconds as the slides load especially nowadays, so don't worry that it's your computer. And speaking of the video, for those who are listening by phone, here are special instructions for the video audio. You go to the speaker icon, the green one up at the top, just to the right of the word audio. Click on that and make sure mute conference audio only is clicked. If you're listening to audio through your computer, no action is needed. And I'll give those reminders when we start the video. We'll start with comments from our host, Ron Rohal, Chair of NACD's Urban and Community Resource Policy Group, which is a subcommittee of our Natural Resources Policy Committee. Ron? And good morning, and I welcome all of you to the monthly Urban and Community Conservation Webinars offered by the National Association of Conservation Districts through the support of our sole sponsor, the Scotts Miracle Grow Company. These sessions are designed by NACD's Urban and Community Resource Policy Group, a subcommittee of district officials and partners charged with guiding the association's services and support for districts' work in developed and developing areas. Our goal through these webinars is to help districts share what they are doing nationwide and enable them to learn from each other and various agencies and organizations and we appreciate the support of the Scotts Miracle Grow Company for making them possible. I invite <coughs> you to let us know what you think about each webinar and what other topics you would like us to cover by contacting NACD staffer Deborah Bogar. And please, tell our NACD officers what type of assistance you would like from your National Association for your urban and community conservation work. And now I'll hand it back over to Deb. All right. Our speaker today is Mike Norton, who is the District Manager of the Pacific Conservation District in the state of Washington. Mike is delayed by about 15 minutes, so we've agreed to show the video that he's um, included. It's a 26-minute video, and I'm going to switch over to that. All right. Again, for those of you listening by phone, uh, go up above the slide and click on that little speaker and make sure mute conference audio only is clicked. And with that, I'm going to start the video. And fingers crossed that it goes smoothly. This is the fastest eroding place on the entire West Coast. 50 years ago, this area was part of a town called North Cove, which extended three miles out. More than 100 homes have sunk in the Pacific here since the 1960s. What's this line here? That's the new erosion. This has occurred within the last two years now. You guys saw this coming, didn't you? That you were going to lose the house to the Pacific Ocean. Yes, when we bought the property back in the 80s, we knew eventually it would come to us. Preserving the memory and whatever else. That's the mentality. Very good. Justin, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Uh, his house now down there. The This is, this is home. This is, wh why would we move? Why would we not make an effort to, to save our home? Every day, the Pacific Ocean swells closer and closer to North Cove an unincorporated beach town in Pacific County, Washington. 
The community could be submerged by 2050, but the residents are unyielding in the face of the West Coast's most aggressive erosion. Around 150 feet of land erodes from the coast every year. The community has steadily retreated inland since the 1970s. At this rate, there will be nowhere left to go. There's no census of the area, no population count, but there's a rich history of cranberry farmers, clam diggers, crab fishermen, and wanderers. The westward movement of the United States, there were always people who were a little bit restless and kept moving west. And when they got here, there was no farther to go. David Cottrell's family moved to North Cove in the late 1800s. He grew up here, attending the local elementary school. He briefly left town to attend Whitman College and the University of Washington, but felt the pole of North Cove call him home. Today, he runs the cranberry farm he inherited from his father with his partner, Connie Allen. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you, honestly, growing up here, um, it felt a little, little small, and I couldn't wait to get away. Uh, but it wasn't really until I had gone out and seen a bit of the world that I realized what it meant to have a community where you were multi-generational and where you knew the families and your grandfather who had known their grandfather. And there's just a sense of place that I took for granted until I saw what it was like to go out and see people who were you know, lived their lives nowhere near where they were born and didn't have, didn't have family around. It's just an amazing place, but don't tell anybody because you kind of want to keep it a secret. <laughs> when Connie and David aren't busy harvesting cranberries, David's working at his second job as the chairman of the Pacific County Drainage District. It's one of those jobs that uh, I, I say sometimes that I got a specialty in, in jobs that pay no money and, and get everybody angry at you. Uh, it's, a, it's a niche I've found. And, not a lot of competition for it, so. but these are the things that keep a community running. David's role as the drainage district chair left him with the difficult challenge of protecting the cranberry bogs from flooding. If you're not stopping the water from flooding and destroying people's homes and livelihoods, you're not doing your business in a drainage district. Managing a drainage district in North Cove isn't an easy job. The town was built on a sand spit. Ever since people settled here, the town's foundations were prone to shifting with the dunes. Sand swept on and off North Cove's beaches in a cycle. Winter storms would wash it away, but the sand would return with the summer wind to build the coast back up. So there seems to be a lot of different things at play at this Washaway Beach or North Cove area, but it really all comes down to is sediment being pulled away from the coast and there's nothing coming in to build up that sediment again. The natural erosion process was intensified by a man-made dredging project that shifted the current in Willapa Bay. And what's happened is that as, as the channel migrates into the coastline, that erodes the coast, and then the sand would be shifted around to fill in the middle part of the bay. Uh, south of the channel. North Cove residents dismantled the local lighthouse, David's elementary school, and the local Grange Hall to stop them from falling into the ocean as the shore moved closer and closer. Soon, homes fell over the edge as well. And there's, no, there's no census, there's no count, but there are a lot, of, a lot of faces that just pull out of the community. People who, who, who have owned a house or, or you know, been here and just, uh, well, it's, it's not a comfortable place to live if you're, if you're seeing the ocean march on your place, and so a lot of people legitimately made other life plans. The choice to move became more pressing in 2007 when a winter storm devastated the community for 10 days. Access to the road was cut off, and emergency services couldn't get to town. Well, I'll tell you, that 2007 storm um, 
we didn't really see it coming. One final look tonight out at the Pacific Ocean. It has just been churning. We have had the hail. We have had the squall lines push through, and we understand. The 07 event, you'll hear people in this community talk about it because it, it just it crippled our community for 10 days. And I know that doesn't seem like a lot, but when you can't leave the area, you're completely cut off, no radio. Uh, electricity's down for 10 days. After five days, you don't have water for another five days. Um, it really did a lot to this community. And even though that was only 10 days, it has had permanent effects. I think somehow we failed to alert people the severity of storm that was coming. I mean, a lot of those people down there are, you know, they're living storm season by storm season. They don't know um, the next big storm could be the one that takes their house out. Um, so they're really kind of taking it day by day down there. The threat that storm surges pose to North Cove residents became a reality for Richard and Diane Harris in 2008. We bought a house in 2000 over on Whipple Avenue, which isn't too far from right here in North Cove. And remember, it was summer of 2008, we could tell that the beach was eroding in front of us. And it was quite, a, we we're probably talking a couple hundred feet out there, but there was a great big drop off that was, that was, that was starting. And I, I remember saying to the, the this is the start of, of where we're gonna lose our house. It started like really washing away probably within two weeks. Yeah. Yeah, um, that particular winter, October, November, December of when we fell in, it was these storms. It was eating a lot of, a lot of property. There, there could be a storm where you, there were maybe they may lose ten or twenty feet um, in a particular storm or a particular high tide. So we had a lot of rain, which a lot of rain, a lot of storms, a lot of high tides, and we were. We went fast. It was sad. 547 acres of land will erode by 2060 if the erosion isn't stopped. Washington State's economy will lose $20.3 million. Soon, this devastation gained international attention and became the story of North Cove. Outlets made the erosion a media spectacle. North Cove was renamed Washaway Beach. On Washaway Beach, live on Washaway Beach. Here on Washaway Beach, and called Washaway Beach after all. The erosion in North Cove, often referred to as Washaway Beach, is at a magnitude that is just huge when we think about erosion rates. So the number that's thrown out a lot is like 100 feet per year, and that is just astronomical in terms of scale. So that is the fastest rates of coastal erosion anywhere on the west coast of the United States. And so you can see it in person where entire town blocks are falling into the ocean each and every year. Uh, the coastal erosion that's occurring at North Cove right now um, has the potential to be a pretty significant impact to the local community and their economy. Um, as people's homes erode and fall into the ocean, um, people leave the area. They don't have anywhere to live. Um, as those people leave, then local businesses that depend on those people to shop in their stores and eat at their restaurants, um, those businesses struggle as well. If nothing's done or if there's a failure here, it will, well, it'll destroy the community. It'll create, it'll completely cut off that landmass going out from Westport to North Cove. I mean, not, I mean, it'll just be gone. Um, then there are, you know, the people that rely on tourism, that'll be over. Um, home prices will just drop to nothing. The, the whole community would be destroyed. Cranberry farming is, is the prominent industry down in North Cove and Pacific County. It's a multi-million dollar industry. Um, there's a lot of um, you know, third, fourth generation cranberry farmers down there um, that are threatened by the coastal erosion. I mean, it's really one big storm event. 
um, is all it would take to get that saltwater infiltration into the cranberry bogs. If it wasn't for tide gates on both ends and the erosion that's been advancing for the last several decades had gotten to a point where if something wasn't done immediately, it was going to come through the last line of defenses, go around the tide gates, and it was going to be flooding several thousand of acres and hundreds of homes and putting a large chunk of the Washington cranberry industry out of business. The bogs in Grays Harbor and Pacific County are the leaders of Washington State's cranberry industry, which was estimated to be worth $8 million in 2016. Uh, the road is very important to the people that live there. It's their main, it's their main access, uh, both north and south. And there's also utilities. The power and water comes from, uh, travels along that highway. So they need that to survive out there. If the erosion goes unchecked, we would lose the entire roadway and everything behind it. The communities there would be non-existent if, if we let the road go. It would just destroy everything uh, from, from the current coastline up to uh, the, the foothills. It's hard for people to think about moving their lives in a forward or positive direction when they aren't even sure if they're going to have a house, a, a, not just a roof over their head, but a floor under their feet. So if something isn't done about the erosion, no houses would exist. Just, it would be a disaster area. There'd be, there'd be nothing to save. Oso, Washington, a small town east of the Puget Sound, was struck by a catastrophic landslide in 2014. 42 people lost their lives. After witnessing the Oso landslide and dealing with the aftermath of the 2007 storm, Pacific County officials realized that a similar catastrophe could happen in North Cove. They held a meeting with North Cove community members to discuss contingency plans. The county suggested putting a tax on houses in high erosion zones to prepare for a cleanup effort. Whether it's the local or state or federal level of government looking at this problem here um, in an area that was termed Washaway Beach, um, was that there really wasn't much we could do. In that meeting, I stood up and made a statement to the effect that, look, we had a job to do here, and we needed to save our community, and we would welcome any help and technical assistance on the right way to do it, and we would welcome any funding to help us do that. And if people wanted to step up, come and see me, and if you didn't want to step up, don't be complaining if you see cranberry growers doing it own, their own way, which might mean every old truck and tractor uh, just driven down and shoved over the side to stop the erosion. And we didn't want to do it that way, but if there was a better way, you better step up and help us. Mike Norden was at the same county meeting. Norden, who works for the Conservation District in Pacific County in Grays Harbor, was familiar with David's frustration and impressed with his determination. After the meeting, Mike came up and uh, said, I heard what you said, and I liked what you said, and um, what would you do if we could find $50,000 worth of funding? Show me a plan. So when I went to the people I knew, who, and I said, okay, what could we do if we had funding? So using large rocks locked together to make a, a, a sloping rock wall was, was our, our first effort. After the initial project, David continued researching the most effective ways to combat the erosion. With guidance from coastal engineer George Kaminsky, funds from the conservation district, and donations from residents, North Coast started to craft a revetment wall of its own. A group of engineers from the Department of Transportation was out talking to us, uh, and they, they were starting to do their first test project on the dynamic revetment down there, and we were looking at some of the problems where we just couldn't figure out how to defend these really steep sandbanks. One, they said, you should check out dynamic revetment, and they gave me just the phrase and a couple of names of, of people who had published papers before. And then I went online and just, you know, Google's your friend, and um, all this stuff started um, appearing, and I had more and more questions, and so I started using the resources of people like George Kaminsky. I said, hey, here's what's going on. This is what seems to be happening. Does this make sense to you? And he'd send me somebody else's thesis that he'd 
co-authored and you know so I just started on this really rapid self-education process on trying to figure out this this what science was out there and how it applied in our situation. And so what, what we're looking at with the dynamic revetment is reducing the energy against the sandbank that was there originally and um, making it in a way that it dissipates it gradually. It doesn't slam into the coast and chew the coastline away and scour the sand out, but in a way that's more gentle, that it runs up onto the rocks and slows the uh, energy down and then actually can, in the right conditions, drop out sand and pile sand up against the rock. As North Cove struggled to fight the waves, Shoalwater Tribe was experiencing erosion threats of their own. Almost all the tribes, including us, in, on the coast, are planning an uphill move. Well, it takes a lot of money to go uphill, and you lose your traditional lands, which you're trying to fight to save. But uh, that's our only, our only thing that we'll be able to do, because the erosion happens fast. Shoalwater Tribal Chair Charlene Nelson contacted David, Connie, the Department of Transportation, Pacific County, and the Conservation District. She invited them to the reservation to share information about their efforts to address the erosion. This group of local leaders became known as WECAN, or Willapa Erosion Control Action Now. The members have been learning from one another as they continue to work towards a solution. You have to go about it a different way and people have to look at it. We can. We can do something and we actually started the uh, gathering, uh, meeting, uh, and we named it We Can. As they are doing research, they've been sharing the data with us. As we've been going out and doing the trial and error adaptive management and learning things there, we've been sharing with them. And so what you've been seeing, what if you, if you were to trace back through our project and their project, you'd see the two converging as we each learn from each other. With WeCan's help, Pacific County hired global engineering firm Mott McDonald to look into engineering a bigger project. They hope to implement a dynamic revetment wall all along the coast, from North Cove to Tokeland, if they can find the funding. In addition to protecting the coast, this project will help coastal engineers understand how dynamic revetment works so it can be replicated in places struggling with erosion, like North Cove. For a project on that scale, yeah, that's going to require state funding. And that's going to be, well, you saw some of the numbers tonight. Um, those, are, those are approximate, um, and there's still a lot of hammering out to be done. But that's what it would take to do a one-time large-scale fix. As community members joined the We Can Committee, Connie and local store owner Jeanette Hudson began their mission to change the public perception of North Cove. Well, the, the idea that we needed to lose that moniker of wash away um, started with uh, Charlene Nelson from the tribe. And she just uh, talked about how names really have much more of an effect than just the syllables that they are, and that we needed to think of, think of this area differently. Because nobody believed beyond uh, the word wash away, which is not it's the name of the area, it's North Cove. And it became, you know, uh, a negative, extremely negative, you know. Well, what can you do? It's going to wash away. Well, we don't think so. Well, when I have patrons come in the shop, I acknowledge Washaway Beach and let them know it's really iconic, but we've, we're doing a campaign now, it's called Washaway No More. And it's about erosion control and how to save our beach, and we're all paying it forward to make a little bit of difference. Actually, in our shop, we have a campaign going. You can buy a hoodie, a tank top, an apron for $15, and it says Washaway No More and it puts two cubic yards of rock on our beach. I like the idea of the no more as being a very strident way of making that statement. Um, to me, it's, it, was a, it started as um, a line in the sand. It was started in uh, late 2017 that um, no more houses were gonna go in. We we're gonna do whatever it took for that to happen. And um, that has been true. 
Not only did no houses go in since then, but this year no trees have gone in either. And maybe next year no land will go in. So we're keeping it here. I really think that North Cove is going through a, a, a strong identity, and a lot of that is pulling together and, and making a big change here. Um, it used to be centered a lot more around the shellfish industry, but it's become more of an artist community. There's a lot of people who are here who, yes, they have other jobs. They may do some substitute teaching, but they also are phenomenal artists that are known not just in this area, but outside. Um, and I think it's, it's got a lot going for that as far as being a very inspiring place to live. We're all interconnected and we all value each other's opinions and we all have actually collaborated to make a, a difference on like different issues or um, the economy out here. We're trying to bring in commerce and we're helping each other and networking. So no, I really love it out here. I'm, I'm glad I'm out here. Even if it's for a short duration, I'm gonna ride the wave. The future may be murky, but the residents of North Cove continue rallying against the waves. The most important thing is the voices of the people that are here. I mean, when they speak, that's that's what needs to be listened to. Being able to step into it slowly has really um, changed the, the viewpoint of it. There is something we can do here. It's not a lost cause. I tend to, to think of it like a lot of farmers do, of one crop at a time. It's kind of like the erosion that comes in the opposite season, that comes in the winters. And we'll, if we can get through one winter at a time on the erosion and one harvest at a time on the cranberries, everything will be just fine. It is such, such a life of contradictions because it's, it's exciting. Um, it has an element of danger in it. Um, I think for most of the of us who live on the edge, it just um, creates a heightened level of aliveness, a recognition that everything that we have and own and cherish uh, that's material could disappear. And then so our connection is much more with those things that are going to, to stick around. Um, you know, the sand will always be here. The waves will always be here and that edge between the sand and the waves sometimes changes.
So can you guys hear me? Oh my goodness, I'm yapping away and I'm, my phone was muted. Sorry about that, folks. Um, yes, welcome, Mike. And if the slides are up on your screen, then you can take it from there uh, using these slide, the arrows down in the lower left corner. Gotcha. So hello, all. Um, I'm sure that you guys are all from coastal communities across the United States or even not coastal. I see two people on the list that I know. Uh, my name is Mike Norton. I'm the manager of not only the Pacific Conservation District, where this project uh, took place, but also the Grace Harbor Conservation District. I'm also the vice chair of the Pacific County Marine Resource Committee, and I'm also a member of the uh, uh, Willapa uh, Lead Entity for Salmon Recovery. Um, and on top of doing all that, uh, because we're always short-staffed, we do not have a shellfish specialist. So whenever it comes up to anything in the bay, the dealing with shellfish, erosion, crabs, or something like that, I have to take the lead on those things. Um, but you get to meet a lot of really cool people. Um, before I move on, um, so well, I, I was running a little late, and I apologize. Um, I kind of got taught by the uh, time change kind of instructions. But on that picture that you're looking at right now, the North Cove, Washington, Washaway Beach, no more, is, I think you heard that uh, that story, that uh, moniker being told in the, in the video quite well. Um, I want to point out to the picture in the lower right behind there with all the road closure, there used to be a town out there. Um, over 100 years, they've lost two by six square miles of uh, land on the coast. Uh, I don't know this for sure, but I've been told that it's the largest land erosion in the country. Um, but I know that there's lots of storms and lots of events that have happened over the last 100 years, so I, I couldn't confirm that. Um, okay. This kind of gives an idea of what's happened. Um, as you can see in the yellow outline down below, there used to be more spits down there. Um, and now we're just down to the Tokeland spit, which is just to the right there, um, it, mainly with the, the red and yellow on the right. Um, Willapa Bay at the mouth used to have uh, shoals. Uh, There's no deepened channel. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers, because of uh, industry needs, uh, dredged a channel for shipping. And what they didn't realize um, or didn't think of was that the Willapa Bay is such a large estuary that that tidal uh, change twice a day is twice the energy of the mouth of Mississippi. So it just started uh, chewing away in one spot instead of having all that energy spanned over seven miles. Um, and that's ultimately what started digging out all this uh, shoreline. Okay. This is where we're at now, and uh, or pretty close to. Um, we, uh, as you can see, there's um, a lot of uh, the energy kind of gets tied up right there. It's kind of hard without a pointer. Yeah, okay. Can you guys see my pointer moving? Yes, we can. Oh, that's, okay. that's fine. <laughs> um, to do a pointer, you want to go up to the up above the slide on the right. There's an arrow. Gotcha. I see Put it. Put your mouse on it. Okay. So this little knob right here in the dead center of the map is a guy's house, and the land actually used to be further out here, and he saw the writing on the wall and unlike where everybody else was, you know, their houses were going into the ocean. Uh, he had the, the means to pay to have, he started burying rock in his yard. And eventually when the shoreline got there, it uh, wrapped around his house and he didn't need any permitting because it was already there. Um, and that, so this has become kind of a, a, a groin here. 
there's also a groin that was built years ago to try and work on this issue way down here. Uh, further down off the map is the Tokeland property. And I'll talk more about that later. But this is the work area for the Conservation District, this whole uh, colored area that we've been monitoring. The uh, right here is the Grayland Spit, I mean, excuse me, the Grayland Ditch. And this ditch goes all the way here and it actually goes all the way to the next harbor, Gray's Harbor. The highest elevation point is 15 feet. So when we have a king tide, if this road goes away, all of the cranberry industry here will be gone. And it goes, this is just a small picture of it, it goes all the way to Gray's Harbor. Uh, this point here, where it's red right here, just outside here used to be a parking lot and uh, bathrooms for uh, the state parks and the beach approach used to go all the way out here and that was gone taken away in just uh, one week of storms so yeah that's where the video is supposed to be okay so details project so what you're looking here is uh, is phase two of our project. Um, before this phase one was a right here was a small test site that we did um, for about fifty thousand dollars, and it worked very well. We put in a we did put in riprap there and then buried it in sand and then covered in wood, it's kind of a high bank. But we did that because uh, just behind here is a National Historic Site. So we chose that as the, the first attempt to try and slow the shoreline from eroding so we could save that historical site. Uh, but each one of these sections here, by the way, this is, this is that house again. And here it is here to split the screen up. Um, and then the, the Grayland Ditch is right down here. So we have different types of uh, engineering, um, everything from the difference between a regular dynamic revetment is uh, the, the regular dynamic revetment is a long stretched out flat four to one ratio um, cobbling of the beach. The high dynamic revetment is where we uh, pilot onto the shoreline because they're a higher slope. And then in hopes everything would just kind of uh, mellow out and do what it's supposed to do. As you saw in the video, um, they place it and then the, beat, the the shoreline or the ocean does what it needs to do with the cobbled rock. Um, all of the area here, not only did we put some kind of cobbled rock, but also uh, we, we've been placing lots of wood, uh, not engineered, not uh, tied, but uh, just on the shoreline. And then we've been placing on the high berms uh, sand and doing vegetation. We are actually into the third phase now to where we've taken everything that you see here and added it. We're putting it up to 18 and a half feet and uh, going to a five to one ratio, or as uh, David Cottrell in the video would say, putting another coat of paint on, uh, putting a little bit more uh, rock there. So this is kind of what it looks like. Um, you get, actually I got these pictures wrong. <laughs> so this first one, this is what it looks like when it's placed. The left side is what it looks like after the, the shoreline normalizes, uh, moves the wood around, moves the cobbled, and, and uh, uh, puts it how it wants it. The interesting thing is, is what I found when I'm out there, I don't know how to mimic this, but it's one of the most unique sounds here that, that uh, we've hit the rock. It's a, kind of a weird quaking rock, um, I don't know, shaking sound, and, but it's very uh, calming. It's, it's a pretty cool thing. Um, and we, we des this design comes from looking at natural uh, uh, formations up and down the Oregon and Washington coast. Uh, I recently visited uh, Ray Alto Beach up near La Push, up the Washington coast 
where it has this natural formation, and you pretty much couldn't tell the difference between this site and their site um, anymore. Let's see here. So, so I'm going to show you a series of pictures, um, before and after kind of shots. Like it says here, this is a uh, this is the events over one winter in 2020, this last year. Um, so this is what it was like before the storm, same area after in the spring. Um, or the interesting thing is, is that we've been monitoring with the Department of Ecology, like they said in the video, um, everything from pit tagging rock and wood and uh, trying to see where things are going, but also measuring the cruel of sand. And uh, I can tell you that we're finding out that even though we lose sand in the summertime, over the last couple of years, we've actually accrued sand now. So instead of losing ground, we're actually gaining ground. Here's another before picture. This is when we placed, this is that high dynamic leading into the regular, regular dynamic. And uh, this is what it looks afterwards. And you can see here where you're getting deposits and uh, seeing how it's, it's naturally making these berms. And as I said before, Wellapa Bay is quite big. Uh, just the mouth here from here to here is seven miles. So you can see there's a lot of water in here, and it's all shellfish industry. And I wanted to, after talking about the project, because you saw the video and everything, I wanted to highlight some of the other problems we're dealing with that are also tied to the North Cove. Um, so we had uh, Spartina all up and down the bay. We had over 9,000 acres of it. Um, we had a massive program to get rid of it. We're down to less than two acres of it spread over the bay. Um, but because of that, the sediment has kind of gone a little crazy in the bay and also in Grace Harbor. So we have a sediment study going on right now, the sediment transport number two. And we're looking at the effects of dredging and how to use best management practices to hold it back. And trying to, same along with uh, the North Grove issue, we're having erosion all over the place. Um, so we're, we're looking into that. Um, we have once you took the Spartina out, which was an invasive species for here, I know it's a native species on the East Coast, but it's not supposed to be here. But after that went out, we've had an explosion of burrowing shrimp and invasive japonica eelgrass and, uh, and green crab. And we're, we have programs that are um, dealing with trying to deal with that too, including uh, doing a uh, drone footage um, doing a scan over the landscape and being able to map out uh, borough counts and Japonica uh, areas, mapping it out. Working with uh, NOAA and uh, um, PNNL, which is the Pacific North, anyway, it's the Pacific Power Federal guys out of our area. This is burrowing shrimp. It turns uh, the substrate into a putrid mess and you can't grow shellfish in it, they sink. Oh, by the way, I'm backing up on the slide here. Um, everything in blue in this picture are privately owned tide beds. So uh, the shellfish growers have owned tide beds since before, tide lands since pre-state. Uh, the green is uh, state ground. Sorry about that. It is state ground. And there's a lot of leased activities in those areas. Okay, and just for your education, this is the difference between a native eelgrass, uh, Zostra marina is the thicker blade, and Zostra japonica is this thinner blade. Uh, Zostra japonica lays down and collects sediment and once again creates a putrid mess where the native stands up and is more of a, uh, it's a filter.
I'm in a conference right now. Yeah, not the same thing. Sorry about that. This is our sediment project and all the different steps we're doing. Um, every, we're trying to collect all this stuff, bathymetry. Uh, we're working with the Army Corps of Engineers for um, a lot of this stuff. And uh, we've hired uh, Stantec, an engineering group. Uh, we're working with uh, the locals, a local work group, including the tribes, to try and make sure that we're looking at the right things. This, all this is going to tie into the North Cove project also because there's more work to be done there. Uh, we're looking to have a groin put in and uh, a, a, another one's further out and uh, also do a lot more dynamic revetment. There's three work areas. One is our work area, another is the DOT, the Department of Transportation's area right in the middle, and then there's the tribe who has been uh, on the Toklan Spit. It's been working with the Army Corps of Engineers. And even though they're all kind of separate projects, we try to coordinate in meetings to try to make sure we're all on the same page and uh, trying to share science. And it's uh, been a really good partnership. Uh, some people ask how, how come we've been so successful on this, and that's we're really not quite sure about that, except for that it's such a terrible problem that everybody knows something has to be done, so everybody's on board. Um, and it, and that's all I can say is, is that you have to you have to try and get everybody on board to make this work. Otherwise, it wouldn't. If any of the agencies or federal agencies stopped it up, um, you wouldn't be able to move forward on it. These are some of the proposed ideas is dealing with sediment and erosional issues, um, everything from oyster reefs to uh, we also have a project going in, in Grace Harbor doing a practice thing of loading up the upper watershed with wood so that there's uh, more pooling of the water and slow percolation of the streams instead of having it just run straight out. Um, we'll see if that works. Other than that, I don't know what my time is here. I guess it's 9.47. You guys are supposed to be done. So if anybody has any questions, I'm more than willing to take some. Fascinating, both that video and your additional comments, Mike. Um, while we're waiting to see if we do get any questions or comments, which people, you can type it into that lower, uh, the box on your lower left and then hit enter. It looks like we have a few coming in. Mike, I'm curious, that house you pointed out a couple times on that little spit, how is that still there? <laughs> uh, the, the humorous thing is that, so I'm going to, whoops, let's see here. Uh, oh, yeah, that house, that first hanging house, the one that's just hanging there, it actually still is there. And we built the dynamic revetment, revetment right up to the corner of it. And it is the closest house you're ever going to get to beachfront property. It's just, it's right there. Um, and it just, we, we started saving the ground and it, it survived. A lot of the houses in the area are now off the tax code because, you know, the county trying to help these people out that are losing ground. Um, our goal is, is to start accruing land and get those houses back, back on the tax rolls. Cool. Interesting. All right, we have uh, two so far from Victoria. Is there a moratorium on development in the area? I heard Connie say no houses, no trees, no land. Could you elaborate? Also, yeah, there, how many sorry. miles total is the project? Uh, the project area for our part is 1.2 miles, but that's just our part. Um, the DOT area is about 3 quarters of a mile and the uh, Toklan spit, and basically all they did is they put sand out there, which um, there is a snowy plover issue where we're trying to, we're also trying to restore habitat for snowy plover, which prefers sand beaches. So the Toklan spit is mainly sand, and they keep putting more sand there, and it'll be a constant, um, they'll constantly have to be repairing that. Uh, but their area is about uh, three miles long. Okay. 
Um, as far as the moratorium issue, yes, there is a moratorium of building in the area, um, any houses. Um, but that's kind of loose in the way to where um, some people have gone in and put motorhomes or, or excuse me, um, single wides in there because uh, they still have property and they're still allowed to they're still allowed to use their property. Um, but over the last two years since we've been having successes, um, like I said, we're hoping to get people back onto the tax rolls and. Uh, you know, go back to business as usual, I guess. Okay. Uh, from Chuck, we have, what is the purpose of wood on top of resentment? And doesn't, don't wait, take them away. So we understand that uh, the ocean takes away just as much as it gives. And what we we've have found with this, uh, most of this wood that we place, place out there uh, we try to interlink them, lay them top of, on, on top of each other. Um, when, the, when the wave action is so high in there, it actually pushes more wood in and creates a line barrier. And we put the wood in there because, uh, well, first of all, it's good for habitat for birds and um, other critters. But also, it does help hold the shoreline and the rock in there. Um, in fact, we've been watching and making sure that um, some folks who like to collect firewood from the beach, that this area is a, a no spot to that. Um, we, uh, we did another project, a wood project down in, uh, on the Columbia River in the Chinook area, and we interlinked uh, over 260 pieces of wood using cable and pilings. And that is also accruing sand down there because we were trying to save the last beach in the area there. Um, we're, fortunately, unfortunately, we're getting to be pretty good at this stuff. And, um, but wood is always on the, on the west coast here. It's, it's a native structure for um, a lot of habitat around here and for shorelines. So we just try to mimic the natural as much as we possibly can. If it's, if it's worked in nature, it should work for us if we can re-engineer it. Cool. Also from Chuck, do the elevations of the revetment projects take into account sea level rise from climate change? Yeah, and that's the reason why we were modeled that um, we were told to go to 18 and a half feet. The first version was 15 feet. Um, and we were told that we probably should go up to 18 and a half feet because king tides right now, they run about 15, 15 and a half feet. And it, the problem isn't just, you know, as I think David said in the video, it's not so much the water getting over the shoreline. Uh, the problem is, is when the water wants to get back out. And if you don't have a good um, pop to your bank, um, that's when you get a little bit of a crack in the shoreline in the sand and it just starts eroding away. So we need to have that bank up to 18 and a half feet, cover it with uh, vegetation, and that should, uh, according to the engineers, that should do us pretty well. Uh, like I said, we're going to try and put two groins further out, and that should help uh, protect the shoreline a little bit more too, besides just the elevation. Um, I to, honestly, to sea level rise is something that um, it hasn't affected us as much in our area because the way the continental shelf is, it actually lifts up in our area. And I don't know if you've heard of the big earthquake that potentially or is supposed to happen about every 350 years to 400 years around here. That drops in the world um, if or when that it happens. And I think that our issues at that point will be so extreme that I, I'm not quite sure that our 18 and a half feet is going to matter very much at all. I mean, I'm just being realistic about that. Right. And yikes. Um, and the last question uh, from Victoria. Is there an estimate for, for longevity of the mitigation, or will you have to keep replacing riprap periodically? Well, and first of all, we're not using riprap. It is a smaller cobbled rock that actually can break down 
by the ocean. The ocean actually breaks down and puts it into the shape and size it wants. Riprap is a, a larger rock, uh, as probably a lot of you guys know. Um, so we're not using that. Um, but the maintenance, we thought the cost was going to be super high. Um, we're finding out the maintenance is much less, uh, especially when this cobbled rock, when you're doing it by load, um, it, just one or two load rock can fix any kind of hole. And it's so inexpensive that even a landowner on their shoreline could add the, the rock themselves. Um, and we have a couple local rock pits that's using the exact same rock that we're supposed to be using. Um, as far as long term, if like something major happened, um, we are seeking federal and state funds to do our what we call a larger fix. And uh, yeah, we're still waiting to see if we're going to get funding for that. But we're estimated is about eight million dollars is what it's going to cost. Wow. So, so far, we've done quite a bit for a very cheap dime, but um, if we want to do really, you know, big permanent stuff, it's going to cost money. So when the ocean breaks down that cobbled rock and they get smaller pieces, that's what makes that sound you described, that kind of soothing sound, correct? Yeah, and it only, the funny thing is, is that it only, it only breaks it down to a certain point and rounds out the rocks and then the, they just stay in that size as you saw in one of those pictures. Right, very cool. Um, okay, one last comment from Victoria. Excellent video, enjoyed it. Best of luck to your community. Uh, and thank with you. That, yeah. Yeah. Um, with that, Mike, I want to say a huge thank you to you. Uh, it worked out just fine showing the video first. And I've had other speakers kind of um, mistake those, you know, the time zone. So no worries there. This is a great <laughs> presentation, and we really appreciate your time here. Okay. Well, thank you, and uh, good luck on all your guys' endeavors. All right. And for our audience, okay. uh, just a reminder to check out the uh, resources on our urban community resources on our website at the link there. And if you haven't already joined our network on Facebook, there's that link. If you have something that you'd like to showcase on that, send me a brief description, maybe one line and a photo, and I'll get that posted for you. And then finally, I invite you all to join us next week or next month for uh, another West Coast presentation, this one from the Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District in Oregon. And they'll be talking about their urban conservation program and outreach. With that, thank you, everyone. Uh, goodbye, and stay well. Bye now.